trying to uh, examine the respiratory system and uh, I will uh, talk about the basic principles in general examination related to the respiratory system in addition to uh, the chest examination, the proper chest examination. First of all, you have to look at the patient and see what is his position. Uh, is he comfortable in bed? Uh, otherwise, if he is orthopnic or dysnic or tachypnic, we have to comment. For example, if you look at this patient, he is lying comfortably in bed and not in respiratory distress, of course, and uh, not connected to any IV lines. There is no oxygen. If there is oxygen or IV lines, we have to comment it. Number of pillows patient is using is extremely important because sometimes the patient is lying flat, but at the same time he is using two or three pillows, which uh, uh, of course should be an uh, uh, abnormal sign. And then try to talk to patients, see if he is conscious or alert or not. How are you? Fine. You okay? Yes. You know where are you now? Yes. Okay, good. And what time? Uh, is it the morning or evening? Evening. Evening. So this indicates that really he is uh, uh, oriented to time and place. And of course, you ask about person because Patients with uh, carbon dioxide narcosis, so-called carbon dioxide narcosis in, in cases of uh, respiratory failure, they usually uh, are either drowsy or disoriented or sometimes maybe uh, uh, totally unconscious. <clears throat> and then you have the uh, uh, choice, either you start by hand and then you go up or start to the head and neck and then you go down. Look at the hand first and try to feel the temperature of the hand because uh, very common in patients with respiratory failure you get warm hand and the warm hand is due to vasodilatation because of carbon dioxide accumulation we know that carbon dioxide is vasodilator and uh, see if it's sweating or not because again sweaty hand may indicate hyperdynamic circulation uh, nails to examine the nails, you have to put it in this position, like that, and then look carefully from the side. Uh, clubbing, if it is present, should be apparent, and the uh, definition of clubbing is obliteration of this angle. This angle, of course, is the angle between the nail and the nail bed. This area is called nail bed, so it is between the nail and nail bed. Clubbing, if it is there, may be first degree obliteration of the angle, second degree when there is increased curvature or so-called uh, palate peak appearance, or maybe stage three when you get the drumstick, stage four if you get drumstick together with arthritis of the wrist, as seen in patients with. Uh, bronchogenic carcinoma. The color of the nail itself is important because patients with respiratory failure may have cyanosis and if there is cyanosis it will be central cyanosis, combination of the tongue and the periphery also. In such condition you will find cyanosis in the nail as well as in the tongue. There is no peripheral cyanosis alone in patients with respiratory disease. Cyanosis in respiratory disease is almost always central. So it's a combination of tongue and nails. And again, in such condition, the hand will be warm because of carbon dioxide accumulation. Sometimes you'll be asked uh, how to check for clubbing. In addition to an inspection, you may be asked to do so-called fluctuation. When you press with uh, your index finger in one side, and get the impression on the other index, or you may use the thumb to do like this. This patient, of course, doesn't have fluctuation, but if there is fluctuation, you will feel as if the nail itself is loose and it is movable. I mean the nail bed. And this may be the only sign indicating that the patient has clock. Then, can you do like this, please? Open this. Check now for tremors. First, find tremors. 
And if they are not apparent in this position, they are not clear, you may put a piece of paper like this and uh, observe. There is fine tremors, should be the patient who is expert. These may have fine tremors due to drugs. If he is taking beta agonists like salbutamol or uh, uh, the related uh, drugs, uh, as in case of bronchial asthma or COPD, they may be taking salbutamol or other beta agonists. And then check for flapping tremors. Open the fingers like this, stretch, so the elbow should be stretched, the rest joint should be also fully stretched like this, and then you ask the patient to move his hand backwards, like that, yeah, and then gently of course, gently, not strongly, you give a small little push like this, and then wait, there is flabbing to the ones patient finger will be moving like that. So again, extend, and then ask him to get his wrist back, and then gently, you do like this, and then you see. Again, if there are flapping tremors, the hand will do like this, like this. Flapping tremor, of course, is an important sign in the sweat system because it indicates uh, an uh, imminent respiratory failure and a severe carbon dioxide retention. Uh, we have to remember that flapping tremors are not specific for respiratory disease because you may get flapping tremors in other uh, diseases, abdominal or cardiac or renal, etc., uh, as we are going to mention later on. And then you look for any dilated veins in the hand, in the arm, both sides, indicate carbon dioxide accumulation, and in the palm, especially when it is warm and sweaty, you may get something like this. Look at this red color here. If it is more than that, including the thena, hypothena, areas and the bulbs of the fingers at the distal phalanges. So again, thena, bulbs, hypothena. If it is erythematous, we call it palmar erythema. And palmar erythema again is a sign of carbon dioxide tension. So carbon dioxide tension leads to vasodilatation. A vasodilatation may give warm hand, sweaty hand, flapping tremors, as well as the pulmonary seam. All these are signs of carbon dioxide retention if it is there. The pulse is extremely important because we are especially interested in the volume and the rhythm. The volume, in case of carbon dioxide accumulation or retention, the volume is usually a high volume. So you will appreciate if you put the two fingers on the radial artery in this position and wait a little and feel the volume. And if it is high volume, then it is a must that you check for the so-called uh, uh, collapsing pulse or some people they call it water hammer, but collapsing is a better description. So again you feel for volume, if it is high volume, get the arm of the patient up and apply a little pressure by this area on that place, not here, no, at the distal third of the forearm and keep uh, elevating the arm for some time like this. You may help to assist by this, but one hand is enough. And if you feel any pulse in this area, in that position, by your hand, this is abnormal. You should not feel because the radial artery is not felt in this place, in this position. So if you feel the radial pulsation in this position, in this area, by your hand, it's, it is called collapsing pulse. Collapsing pulse. And collapsing pulse indicates hyper 
dynamic circulation here, hyperdynamic circulation, due to what again? It's carbon dioxide accumulation. So to summarize now, the science for carbon dioxide retention or accumulation till now are warm hand and sweaty hand, palmar edema, flat tremors, high volume pulse, and collapsing pulse. Carbon dioxide retention is a cause of hyperdynamic circulation. It is a cause of hyperdynamic circulation. In such condition, you'll find the difference between systolic and diastolic more than the usual, the so-called high pulse pressure. And then you move to a patient for the lymph nodes. I know that it is uh, very, very unlikely to feel the so-called epitrochlear lymph nodes, but you have to do it, you have to test for it. Feel the radial, the uh, brachial artery, brachial artery, and then medial to it, a little medial, you start to palpate for any lymph nodes. Any lymph nodes in this area are called epitrochlear lymph nodes. Epitrochlear. They are not likely to be seen unless patient, of course, has uh, some form of generalized lymphadenopathy and which is of great significant report may indicate the patient may have tuberculosis, may have malignancy somewhere, and if you feel some epitrochlear lymph nodes here, you have to try to palpate the other side also. And uh, you have to palpate the radial artery bilaterally. I'm, I'm just concentrating on the relation of the pulse to the respiratory system. But any exam, or for example, was when you palpate the radial artery, you have to follow the system which you learned before. That is the rate, the rate, the volume collapsing. Then you feel and see if it is synchronized bilaterally and if it is absent here or there. But the most important in the relation to the spread system, of course, will be the volume and the rhythm. Now, what is the common irregularity of the pulse you get in this? If you are asking why you want to check for the rhythm, we we'll say that the common rhythm abnormality or irregularity in the spread system is atrial fibrillation, because in chronic obstructive airway disease, patient may have atrial fibrillation. And next to it, premature contraction. So you have to feel careful for the rhythm in addition to the rhythm, to the rate. If you your lymph node, then you move to the axillary lymph node. In order to check for axillary lymph node, you have to remember that this is the right side. So you check the right axilla by the left hand and vice versa. And you have to be relaxed, you have to sit by the patient and make sure that he is relaxing his arm. He is relaxing his arm, not stretching it. And this is the right side, so you feel by the left. One hand will be enough. And no need to complicate the matter and start to put here and there. This means this is enough. You just put it in this position and let the patient relax like that. You may support this by the right, but right axis and nodes are examined by the left in this position. And you remember the groups because you may be asked about groups of nodes. When you press, start by the apical group first, deep like this. Move your hands like that, and then go to the medial medial group is close to the ribs and very near to the pectoralis major muscle. And then go to the lateral group and try to feel. And again it is close to the muscles of the upper arm and the humerus. And then anterior group, you pinch the pectoralis like this and try to feel. And posterior group, again, use all your hand try to feel. So apical, medial, lateral, anterior, posterior. And all this by the right hand. Of course, if you examine the left arm, it should be by the right 
and place your score again with the patient to the left. This is his left arm and this is your right hand and you do the same here, apical group, medial group, lateral group, anterior and posterior. Examination of the lymph nodes, of course, is extremely important because we know that diseases like malignancies, lymphomas, tuberculosis, etc., may involve the lymph nodes anywhere. There is no close relation between joints and the respiratory system unless there are some diseases, for example, terminal carcinoma of the lung may involve the joints of the rest, but unlikely to get other joint involvement in the patient with respect to disease in general is, it is associated with other problems. So we will skip the shoulder and the elbow joints because they are not of a great significance. Now we finish with the upper limbs. Then you move to the head and neck. What are the important signs in the head and neck which are related to the respiratory system? So we start by the mouth and lips or start by the eyes, whatever. In the eyes, the jaundice is not very important here unless some respiratory tumor is involving the liver. Such condition, you may ask patient to look down and that's clear. Make sure that there is daylight and make sure that you are looking carefully, not using your flashlight here or torch on both sides and look for jaundice. But again, this is not very important because unlikely to get involvement of the liver and vicious vessels unless there is malignancy or some related disorders. Pallor is important here. Look up, please. Look at the conjunctiva. We are going to talk about this when we discuss the um, hepatobiliary system. But you look at the conjunctiva for pallor because we know that most of the chronic diseases in general may be associated with the so-called anemia of chronic disease. But other sign is congestion of the conjunctiva itself. Look at the conjunctiva and sometimes look at the sclera for evidence of congestion. You may get dilated veins on the sclera and conjunctiva whenever there is carbon dioxide retention again. Like patients with COPD or advanced severe attack of bronchial asthma, then you may get congestion of the sclera. There are some autoimmune diseases which may involve the uh, iris and the anterior chamber associated with respiratory disorders. But I, I think this is sophisticated and more than what you need at a student level. What is important here is to examine the fundus. Unfortunately, we don't have a score now, but you should remember always to examine the fundus in a patient with a respiratory disease. So why is that? You may be asked, what are you looking for? Why you want to examine the fundus? Remember again, carbon dioxide retention, carbon dioxide is vasodilator, so if you examine the fundus in a patient with severe respiratory disease or respiratory failure, you may expect to find a pilidema or dilated, tortuous, congested retinal vessels. So, even if you don't know how to examine fundus, you should try it. You should know what are you looking for. We are looking here for the pelidema, congested, tortuous, retinal vessels. And then, you go down, look at the lips, of course, for evidence of pallor, for cyanosis, and ask patient to get the tongue. Tongue out, please. Out, more. And then, a little bit here, like that. And you look carefully underneath the tongue the mucous membrane in the under surface of the tongue are looking of course for cyanosis and cyanosis here if it is there would be central cyanosis central cyanosis we may examine also the pharynx for evidence of pharyngitis or whatever but the important sign here you should never forget is the cyanosis peripheral and central the fungus examination the presence of pallor and you may take the advantage and see if the patient is a mouse breather, for example, because many of the people, you notice that they cannot breathe from the nose. And so you can 
uh, check this whenever you examine the head and face of the patient. Some of the patients are on prednisolone, steroids, because of uh, chronic bronchial asthma or other diseases uh, necessitating prednisolone. In such a case, you may get the features of uh, uh, steroid uh, use, that is the moon face, the uh, plethora of the cheeks, and uh, in female you may get normal hairs, and they may indicate the presence of all the fact that the patient is taking prednisone. And then put the patient in a 45 degrees, I think this is not 45 degrees, okay, I think it's wrong, yeah, okay, yeah, like this. Forty-five degrees, because here we have to look carefully for any evidence of uh, uh, increase of the jugular venous pressure. Mind you here that we are looking in the area between the two heads of sinusoid. This is the sternal head. This one, sternal head. Okay, can you like this? Okay. Yeah. So we have here the sternal head of sternostoid, and this is the clavicular head. This one is attached to the sternum, and this one is attached to the clavicle. So in the area between the two heads of sternum sternostoid, can you press down with the chin? Down? Yeah. Okay. Can you press here? I'm trying to show more, more, so the other side. Yeah, you look here, this one is the sternum head. It's clear. That one is the clavicular head. Now there is a groove in between the two. This is the place where you look for internal jugular vein. Now, pulsations of the internal jugular vein are normally present but should be only one centimeter of the clavicle or may not be seen at all. But if it is seen more than that, in that position, that's 45 degrees, so it is abnormal. And if you find that it is high, then you have to measure it. And measurement, of course, as you still remember, will be by the simple technique, this is the uppermost point of pulsation here, the injection plane. Then you get a straight line which should be parallel to the ground or parallel to the bed from the uppermost point of the interjectal pulsation. And this one will drop on the sternal angle directly perpendicular to the ground or the bed. And then the point at which they meet together we will measure in centimeters. This is two centimeters here. And then you add five. Five is the distance between the sternal angle and the right atrium. And two plus five in this case, in this patient, would be seven. Seven is normal. Anything above eight is abnormal. So if the jugular venous pressure is more than eight centimeters of water, eight centimeters of water, it's considered abnormal. Do we expect to get high jugular venous pressure in a patient with respiratory disease? Yes, sometimes. As a sign of respiratory failure, the internal jugular pulsation or the jugular venous pressure is usually above 8, high. In such condition, you may get low limb edema in addition to enlargement and tenderness of the liver. So finding high jugular venous pressure may indicate that the patient is in cold pulmonary. Cold pulmonary, that is right side involvement in a patient with respect to disease, whether it is acute or chronic. So again, if you get high jugular venous pressure that is more than 8, don't forget to palpate for the liver measure it and check if it's tender or not. Check for low limb edema. And then take this opportunity and look for the sternomastoid, the one I've shown to you, and the other muscles of respiration, accessory muscle special. If they are contracting during inspiration in this condition, uh, means that the patient is using his accessory muscle special. What are the accessory muscle respiration in the neck? Actually, all the neck muscles are considered to be accessory muscle respiration. So, sternomastoid, platysmus dorsi, uh, platysma, uh, uh, 
the muscle which is between the two heads of a sternostoid underneath it. It's called scalenius muscle, very thin muscle. And yeah, these are normally not contracting. In normal person, during this, they are not used for respiration in normal cases. But if they are contracting, I notice that they are contracting or the platysma uh, or scalenius muscle in this area or the trapezius or platysmus just side from behind. These are abnormal and they are called accessory muscle of respiration. It means that the patient is in respiratory distress. It means that the patient is having some form of obstruction, either acute or chronic. And look carefully at the suprasternal notch because in a patient who has hyperdynamic circulation, as I said before, when the pulse volume is high, when there is collapsing pulse, when there is pulmonary edema, when the hand is warm, when the face is flushed, you may get pulsation in the suprasternal notch and these are aortic pulsation. Aortic pulsation normally are not seen in suprasternal notch, so the they are seen, they may indicate also hyperdynamic circulation. It is a must that you palpate for lymph nodes in this condition. Please set up. When you palpate for lymph nodes, make a patient comfortable and you may ask him to drop his leg down and uh, his back should be facing you like this. Just remind you what are the groups of lymph nodes of the neck. We start by this small group underneath the chin immediately and in both sides we call it submental lymph nodes and then you move backwards just underneath the angle of the jaw feel for the submandibular lymph nodes both sides and then in front of the auricle try to feel for the pre-auricular lymph nodes like that and then behind the auricle this area, feel for the post auricular lymph node, and then backwards that place, so I feel for occipital lymph nodes. So submental, submandibular, pre auricular, post auricular, occipital. And then you go to the deep cervical lymph nodes, we have anterior, anterior to the sternostoid, and posterior means posterior to the sternostoid, so anterior group group and both anterior and posterior are subdivided into upper and lower this is imaginary line of course there is no line to divide them but the upper part we call it upper deep cervical lymph nodes and the lower part called lower deep cervical lymph nodes how to feel for them just pinch the sternostoid in your hand like that and feel in front of it actually this patient I can feel some lymph nodes just in front of the <coughs> sternostoid and they are deep, so you have to palpate deeply. And at the same time, you move your fingers backwards and try to feel posterior to the stenomastoid or the posterior group. And the same in the lower part. You feel for the anterior cervical lymph nodes in front of stenomastoid and then for posterior group behind the stenomastoid. And then downwards here, in the supraclavicular area, start to feel for supraclavicular lymph nodes. This is the supra just above the clavicle and in front of the trapezius. So we have the clavicle down, the trapezius up. It is a triangle like this, you feel, for supraclavicular lymph nodes. And in between the two heads of sternostoid again, this is the clavicular and this is the sternum, feel by two fingers or one finger for the most important lymph node of the neck, which is related to the respiratory system, that is the so-called uh, scalenius. He has one here, very strange. Yeah. Scalenius lymph nodes are seen commonly in bronchogenic carcinoma. And right or left, this is not like the Chow sign or the Chow glands which are only on the left. If the patient has a tumor in the right side of the chest, then you will get scalenius lymph node in the right side. If he has tumor in the left side, then you have again scalenius on the left side. So, submental, submandibular, preauricular, postauricular, occipital, upper and lower deep cervical, supraclavicular lymph nodes, 
and the scalenous lymph nodes in between the two heads of sinusoid, which are of great significance, again I'm repeating, may indicate uh, a hidden bronchogenic carcinoma. And then, don't forget the tracheal. Tracheal position is important because it may indicate a pathology in the right of the left. And how to feel? Either use one finger only, that is the index finger, you ask patient to elevate the chin a little up. And this is a stenomastoid of the left side, this is the stenomastoid of the right side. In between you'll get the tracheal. And this is supercellular notch. These are our landmarks. So I press one finger only, just medial to the uh, sternal head of sternomastoid, until I feel some resistance. This resistance is the trachea. And then, approximately I estimate what is the distance I have to go until I get resistance here. I can use the same finger again. I repeat the same on the left side. And again, approximately, I get an impression what is the distance uh, until I get that resistance. Or some people, they like to use two fingers. No problem. You can push the middle finger on the left side and the index finger on the right side and see if the trachea is central or not. Normally, it is a little deviated to the right. That is normal. But if it is deviated to the left significantly, this means either there is a lesion in the right side pushing the trachea and mediastinum to the opposite side, or there is atelectasis or fibrosis of the left side pulling the trachea to the left side. You can say the same if the trachea is markedly shifted to the right. So again, either there is something pushing from the left or something pulling from the right. So the position of trachea, you should not forget it in the respiratory system. And I advise everybody when start the examination of the neck is to palpate the trachea first. Because very common that we miss or forget the trachea. When you palpate lymph nodes and look for accessory muscles and uh, examine for suprasternal and lymph, etc., etc., then people tend to miss the trachea and its position and it's considered to be a serious mistake if you are examining the respiratory system because actually it may be shifted markedly right or left and not look very good that you miss it as an important sign. Finishing that, you finish now the so-called general signs which may be related to respiratory system. Of course, don't forget before you leave the general signs to simply Try to press for, uh, check for lower limb edema uh, by applying pressure on the chin of the tibia with your thumb and to make sure that you do the sign in the proper way. So you have to use the thumb on the anterior surface of the tibia, here, on the chin of the tibia. And then apply pressure for some time. Pressure should last from 15 to 20 seconds. Of course, you don't count, because if you start counting one, two, three, like this, you look like a fool. This is only in your head, in your mind. So you press strongly, but of course not very strong to hurt the patient. On the chin of the TV, on the anterior surface, 15 to 20 seconds, and then you move the finger. This patient actually has edema. If you come close here, you will look, come close a little, and then you show this, uh, this edema. And if there is edema, you have to grade it. You move up and do the same and see uh, edema is extending up to what level. Some people say plus one if it is around the ankle, plus two if it is until the middle of the leg, plus three if it is up to the knee. Any edema of the knee is considered to be plus four. But why we are interested in edema? Because edema of the lower limbs, high jugular venous pressure, large tendon river, as I said before, are considered to be signs of respiratory failure, especially core pulmonary. If you check for edema, make sure that you check for edema on both sides, all right? And so you do this in the same thing. What else in the leg you have to look for? Erysema nodosum. Erysema nodosum are erysematous lesions like this, this patient. He has some erysematous lesion, but they are nodular. 
and tender also. And it's even in those not specific for uh, respiratory disease, but one of the causes of erythema endosome is respiratory tract infection, also tuberculosis, malignancy. So erythema endosome are erythematous, nodular lesion on the chin of the tibia, on the anterior surface of the tibia, maybe unilateral, maybe bilateral. So if you check for erythema endosome, make sure that they fulfill the criteria, that they are erythematous, that they are nodular, they are tender, and number four, they are on the anterior surface of the tibia, this is the chin of the tibia. Please don't press with your thumb on any other place because it gives a very bad impression when you press on the muscle like this, or away from the tibia, like this or that. It means that probably you have never seen a patient in your life. Now you move to the chest probe. First, of course, like any other part of the body, you start by inspection. My advice is that always count the respiratory rate. When you start an inspection, you count the respiratory rate. If you don't do it now, you will never do it. You will forget. You have the choice. You may count the respiratory rate very, very initially when you start by uh, examining the vital signs, pulse, blood pressure, etc. But if you postpone it until this stage, then you count it now. How to count it? <coughs> Direct the attention of the patient away from the fact that you are, you are counting his respiratory rate. Because if you notice that you are counting his respiratory rate, he may start to change. He may make it fast, make it slow, because you can control your respiratory rate. So either you start feeling the pulse, but at the same time your eye is on the chest and you are counting the respiratory itself and you should count it in one minute completely. It's not here a quarter of a minute and then multiply by four. This doesn't apply to the respiratory. Or if you don't like this, you may use uh, the other technique. Put the uh, hand and the watch on the abdomen of the patient like this. Your eye is in the watch and then you start to count the movement of your hand. Like that. This is one. Two, three, and so on until you finish one minute. And then this will be the respiratory rate of this patient. Any respiratory rate above 18, when 8 is considered uh, abnormal, I will call it the kidney. It's not hyperventilation. It is not respiratory distress, we call it the kidney. Respiratory distress, you observe it from the very beginning. As I said, when you go to the patient and you see how to know that the respiratory distress, again, I'm repeating. If the patient is not comfortable in that position, if he is orthopnic, if he is tachypnic, if he is using accessory muscle of respiration, especially with oxygen in his nostrils. But we call this the kidney. The kidney, by definition, is a respiratory rate above 18. And then, after counting such a rate, you notice for any other abnormal sign. I'm reminding you that we are doing an inspection now. So, we are looking for. Look first at the apex. Because the position of the apex indicates the position of the mediastinum. Position of the apex should be in the normal place. That is the fifth intercostal space mid-cervical line, like in this patient. If it is deviated to the left or to the right, then you comment on it because it may be a part of mediastinal shift either to the left or to the right. If there is mediastinal shift in a patient with respiratory disease, usually it matches with the position of the trachea. Now, for example, if the trachea is markedly shifted to the left, you'll notice that the apex also, uh, uh, most of the cases, is shifted to the left. If the trachea is pulled markedly, markedly to the right, the apex may be also uh, moving uh, abnormally to the right. Right ventricular dilatation or enlargement, which may be a sign of core pulmonary, does not shift the apex. Right ventricular enlargement does not shift the apex to the left or to the right. But you have to 
look for other sign of right ventricular enlargement. That is the so-called parasternal pulsation, just to the left of the sternum. You look carefully and you keep your eyes at the same level of the anterior part of the chest, or the same level of the sternum, and look for any pulsation on the reception. You may ask the patient to hold his breath. Please hold your breath for some time and look carefully. If there are parasternal pulsations, you will see it. Okay, you can breathe now. Yes. All this is inspection. I didn't put my hand. I'm just looking. And you may take this opportunity also to look for any epigastric pulsation, significant. Because many of the times, epigastric pulsation may indicate the right ventricular enlargement. We are going to talk about this when we examine the patient by palpation. So, spatulate it, and then finish with any pulsations. First, before commenting on other uh, parameters of the inspection of the chest. And then look for any other dilated veins here or there, because sometimes a patient with superior vena cava obstruction, you get dilatation of the veins of the chest. They can be anywhere, in the lateral, in the anterior, or even on the posterior aspect of the chest. If there are any dilated veins, then you have to look for direction of a blood flow. Suppose that we have, so can I put a mark, small mark? Suppose that this is a dilated vein. Then, you apply pressure by both index and empty the vein first. Empty. And then remove the lower one, like this. And notice if the vein is coming full or not. And then repeat again. Remove the upper one. Again, observe for any the filling of the vein. Now, if the vein is becoming filled or full from above down, that is to say, when I remove the upper one, I notice that the direction of blood flow is from above down. This indicates that this patient has superior vena cava obstruction. So, in superior vena cava obstruction, there are dilated veins on the chest anywhere and the direction of blood flow should be from above down. In such a case, you will almost always notice that the jugular venous pressure is high. And many of those people also, you may observe that the internal jugular vein is congested but not pulsating. Any scars of previous surgery will be of importance. And not only surgery, there may be a sign of chest tube scar of a previous chest tube, a scar of a previous trauma of the chest. Biopsy marks, plaster like this, or the dressing, may indicate that this patient have been exposed to tapping or pleural aspiration. So don't miss a sign like that. Needle marks, especially big needles, or the plaster marks here, or there, or in the back. Ask the patient, what is the cause of why they are putting plaster here? He will tell you that they have aspirated some uh, fluid. And you have to ask patient <coughs> about color of fluid because sometimes you, you miss to ask him in the history. So now take opportunity. If you notice that there is a plaster or sign of aspiration, ask him what was the color, what was the amount, how many times he was tapped like this because if it is bloody, for example, or repeatedly accumulating and quickly and rapidly, every day they are tapping him, then we indicate malignancy, for example. If it is purulent, then maybe emphyema, etc. So the color of fluid, the amount of fluid, the frequency of aspiration, how quickly it reaccumulates. These are very important in order to diagnose uh, diseases that involve the fluid. The nipples. Patients who are having a chronic respiratory failure, like COPD, may have gynecomastia because you know that one of the causes of gynecomastia in addition to drugs like aldactol is COPD. A patient may be on aldactol, then you have to check for gynecomastia and of course you know gynecomastia is not only the size, size may indicate fat, but you have to uh, uh, palpate the areola between the two fingers like this and if you feel glandular tissue here or there, glandular tissue, fair 
tissue it indicates gynecomastia. When you are examining the patient, almost keep an eye on him. Patient with carbon dioxide tension very easily they go into deep sleep every now and then and you have to wake him up. Asleep? No. So we said now respiratory rate, pulsations, dilated veins, scars of previous surgery. Marks that they indicate a pleural aspiration or pleural attack. And then the shape of the chest. Shape of the chest may be of great importance because people with uh, chronic uh, uh, obstructive airway disease, they may have the so-called barrel shaped chest. If you can move here. Actually, just by inspection, you can see if the chest is uh, normal in shape or not. Normally, the transverse diameter of the chest should be more than the posterior anterior or anterior posterior diameter. Of course, the best way to check for the PA diameter and compare it with the transverse diameter is by palpation. But even by naked eyes, by inspection, you can see that the chest of this patient is quite normal because the transverse diameter is more. It's important to remember how more, 3 to 2, 2 to 1, 4 to 3, we don't care about this. The most important that the transverse diameter should be more than post anterior diameter. Then during the patient will try to uh, confirm uh, uh, this. And then finally, if the patient using accessory muscle respiration, you notice that you will notice that the intercostal muscles, that these are muscles between the ribs, they are contracting. Take a deep breath, please. Like this. In these areas, again. So you ask the patient to breathe deeply. Some people, you may notice that the intercostal muscles are contracting even without asking them to take a deep breathing, like in severe obstructive airway disease. And then you move to palpation. When you start palpating the chest, my advice is always palpate the apex first because the patient of the apex is part of uh, structure system examination. Again, why? Why? Because as I said, the apex may be shifted to the left, may be shifted to the right. Locate the apex carefully and comment on it. In this patient, we can feel the apex in this place. And then you start to count. I remind you how to count to feel the sternal angle. You move from the superstern notch down until you feel the sternal angle. The intercostal space just below, just below the sternal angle would be a number two, second. And then number three, number four, number five. So the apex of this patient is in the fifth intercostal space and here is the clavicle. You get a line from the middle of the clavicle and this is called the mid clavicle line. So this is in the fifth intercostal space mid clavicle line which is normal. If the apex is shifted laterally or shifted medially you have to comment on that. But unlikely in a respiratory disease to get the apex shifted down because the apex which is shifted down below the fifth intercostal space usually indicate left ventricular dilatation, which is unlikely to be seen in a respiratory disease unless it is associated with a uh, genuine cardiac problem. And then palpate for other pulsations. As I said, the palestinian pulsation, now it is the time to feel. Either you use the eosthenal uh, uh, group of muscle or you use the uh, medial aspect here of the hand, either way. But remember that we prepared for the suprasternal pulsation in the lower third of the sternum. The sternum, you can divide it into three parts, just approximately. Upper third, middle third, and lower third. Now put your hands just lateral to the medial, lateral to the uh, 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 lower third of the sternum, like this and a little and gentle pressure. If the patient has parent's sternal position, notice that your hand will move 
like this with each pass. Right. Or use the medial aspect of the hand, again put it flatter to the sternum in the lower third and apply a little pressure and then you may notice that the hand is moving in this way. So this is called left parasternal heave. Left parasternal heave. In addition to epigastric pulsations, which you can feel coming from above down, from up down, are signs of right ventricular enlargement or right ventricular dilatation. What is the significance of this? If you get right ventricular enlargement, that is to say, left parasternal heave and epigastric pulsations coming from above downwards, this means 100% that this patient has cold pulmonary. What is cold pulmonary? We repeat, right ventricular or right side, let us say, right side of the heart involvement in respiratory disease, whether acute or chronic. This is the most definite sign. High jugular venous pressure alone, palpable level alone, lower limb edema alone, are not sure signs of cold pulmonary. They may suggest it. He may have cold pulmonary. But if I get left parasternal heave and the epigastric pulsations coming from above down, I am sure that this patient has cold pulmonary. Because they are definite and sure signs. So I finish this palpation of the apex, and then other pulsation, in, uh, including the left parasternal and the epigastric pulsations. And then Again, feel for the sternal angle and put your two fingers in the left second intercostal space. If you feel pulsations in this area, left second intercostal space, this means that this patient has pulmonary hypertension. And pulmonary hypertension again indicates cold pulmonary. Cold pulmonary starts usually by pulmonary hypertension and then later on you get signs of right ventricular enlargement. So pulmonary hypertension, left parasternal heave, epigastric pulsations coming from above the nose equals cold pulmonary, right sided involvement of the heart, secondary to uh, respiratory disease, whether acute or chronic. What else you do by palpation? Check for any tenderness on the ribs, on the muscle, the patient may have a trauma of the chest. Make sure that when you check for tenderness, you are looking at the face of the patient. Because you are looking for any tenderness of the chest. Sometimes you will be able to feel the so-called subcutaneous emphysema. Crackling sensation when you palpate like this on the lateral side or even anteriorly. Subcutaneous emphysema is a serious sign. It indicates that the air has escaped from the lung to the subcutaneous tissue. Which is not a good sign, of course. And then, what else? Now we start to prepare for so-called chest expansion. The chest expansion is done in this way. I make sure that the arms are away. And <coughs> we divide <coughs> the lungs into three zones. Upper zone, again, no landmass, but this is approximately. Upper zone, middle zone, and lower zone. Check for chest expansion <coughs> in the upper zone, you can do it like this. You put the fingers above the clavicle and the rest of the hand below and your two thumbs are meeting together. Apply some pressure here. Take a deep breath, please, <sighs> like this. And then observe the movement of your thumb. Again. Then you do the same in the middle zone. But here, remember that you get your hand from the back of the patient and squeeze, squeeze like this, make it tight until the two thumbs meet together. Take a deep breath. Again, I know not that my fingers are moving away from each other by a reasonable distance. Actually, it is more than three centimeters. Again, use that. Normally, the chest expansion should be like this. That is to say, again, look, equal, bilateral, they are the same, they are moving the same distance, and 
3 to 5 centimeters, approximately 3 to 5 centimeters. And then repeat the same in the lower zone. There are no lobes here, I'm talking about zones. Come from the back, apply tight pressure on the chest, squeeze the chest of the patient, sometimes you may get even skin fold here. Make your hand very tight to the chest of the patient and let your thumbs meet together. Take a deep breath. Again, look at this. The patient is breathing normally. Your thumbs are moving equally in both sides and they are more than all in the range of three to five centimeters. Some people, they like to do so-called chest excursion using the tape. We don't have tape now, but if you are using the tape, then it will become more than that. Actually, something in the range of four to six centimeters, you can do it in the middle and in the lower zone, but they have the same significance. Chest expansion is reduced in some diseases, either unilaterally or bilaterally. What are the causes of reduction or decreased chest expansion bilaterally? Bilaterally, of course, the most important, most common is chronic obstructive airway disease. Then, interstitial lung disease if they are bilateral. Trauma of the chest if it is bilateral. But unilateral, of course, differential diagnosis is why. For example, if I get a reduction of chest expansion of one side, this may be due to a lot of diseases, starting from trauma of this side fractures of the ribs, subcutaneous emphysema, pleural diseases, whether it is pleural thickening, pleural calcification, pleural tumors, then pleural cavity, pneumothorax, hydrothorax, hemothorax, pyothorax, etc. And then the lung itself, if the patient has atelectasis, collapse, fibrosis, tumors, uh, uh, and generally, any pathology in the lung, if it is significant in one side, will reduce the chest expansion of this side. So it is your duty to do the test in the proper way, and then comment on it whether it is normal or abnormal. If it is abnormal, then you have to say why it is abnormal. Abnormality may be bilateral, if the chest expansion is limited bilateral, again like COPD or bronchial asthma or severe advanced interstitial lung disease, pulmonary fibrosis, etc. Or unilateral, if this is moving normal but that one is not moving or other way. And then remember the differential diagnosis of decreased chest expansion on both sides and in one side. And then what else? You check for the balance shape checks, which I, I, I said before. By the way, it is not important to uh, uh, do it in this uh, chronological order. For example, you may start by the patient for the so-called uh, uh, diameter of the chest. Or you may start by checking for tenderness of the chest. Or you may start by checking for chest expansion and then you go to uh, shape of the chest, whatever, but don't forget any one of them. Again, chest uh, shape, some people, they ask you, okay, show us your technique in measuring the uh, uh, chest uh, uh, diameter. Then, you come here, you put your hand, the right one, on the spine, on the vertebra and the other one on the sternum, like this. And then, you look at it. This is the so-called postural anterior diameter. You want to measure by tape or whatever, just look at it. And get an idea about how much of this. And then, one hand on the left side, the other one on the right side of the chest, the outermost point, look at it. Look at this, this is called transverse diameter. I, I think it's very clear in this patient that transverse diameter is more than the PA diameter. Again, this is a transverse diameter, and this one is the also anterior diameter. You want to measure it, find it very difficult to keep your hand in this position, 
measured by a tape, and so approximately, you are talking approximately about how to measure it. Some people, they define the postural anterior diameter as the distance between the anterior axillary line, anterior axillary line and the spine. Whatever, the best way is to use the hand. Spine, sternum, distance between them is the PA diameter, and this is called transverse diameter. Normally, as I said before, the transverse diameter should be more than the PA diameter. What is the ratio? Maybe 3 to 2, 4 to 3, whatever. But uh, if the PA diameter, post anterior, is equal to or more than the transverse diameter, we call it barrel shape chest. So what is the barrel shape chest? It is the post anterior diameter which is increased to the extent that it equals the transverse diameter will even becoming more than it. Sometimes while palpating the chest, you may feel the palpable ronchi or so called wheezes. And you can feel it in a patient with an acute attack of a bronchial asthma or in severe uh, chronic obstructive airway disease. You actually you may feel that with this by just putting your hand on the chest, chest of the patient. So finishing that, you finish the so-called palpation uh, 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 for wheezes. Then finally, to complete the palpation of the chest, you have to check for the so-called tactile vocal perimeters. What is that? Apply one hand, here usually the right side. Ask patient to say if he is a foreigner, he cannot speak Arabic, ask him to say 99. Can you say 99 please? 99. Yeah. Again? 99. Again? 99. Again? 99. Again? 99. Again? 99. And then you get the feeling or the vibration of the sound underneath your hand. Normally it should be equal, right? And there is sometimes maybe a little reduced on the area which is above the heart, the precordium, this is because the heart is underneath your hand. But generally speaking, the tactile vocal perimeters should be equal by it. And try to feel for the liver. So you ask him to take a deep breath, feel, and feel for the liver. If you cannot feel the right and the left lobe of the river, we discuss this in detail in abdominal examination, then you try to get it by percussion. Now, before moving to the back, because most of the examiners, I know that they like you to do percussion on the back, uh, we may still examine the front for the so-called liver span, because if you feel the liver, it doesn't mean 100% that the liver is enlarged. It may be toast. Toast by what? Hyperinflation of the chest. Chest is hyperinflating, pushing the liver down. So you may be asked to check for the liver span. So again, remind you, second intercostal space, mid clavicular line, and then you start percussion. Your finger should be in the intercostal space, tight of the chest of the patient, and then you start the percussion of the mid clavicular line. Dot. This is resonant. This is dot. How to confirm that this is the upper border of the liver? You ask a patient to take a deep breathing and hold it. Take a deep breathing. Hold it. You percuss again. Now it is resonant. Get it out, discuss again, done. So we are sure now that this is the upper border of the level. We make a mark or whatever, a small mark of course, because we don't want to stir the patient. And remember that this is in the middle of the line. And from the abdomen, same line, discuss for the right lobe. Remember that your finger should be tight in close contact with the abdominal wall. And then you percuss. Resonant. Resonant. 
Reasoning. Reasoning. Dull. This is reasoning. This is dull. So this is the lower border of the level. And then measure the distance between the upper border and the lower border. And it should be in the normal range, which is 10 plus minus 2. So from 8 to 12 centimeters, clearly that this is normal level span, but always use the tape. If the lever is toes, it may be palpable, but still the span is normal. But if the lever is enlarged, check whether it is also tender or not. If it is enlarged and tender, it indicates congestion or malignancy. Congestion due to right side heart failure or malignancy if the patient has some bronchogenic carcinoma or pleural tumor metastasizing to the lever. And then, many of the examiners, they like to percuss the back. Why percussion of the back? Because percussion of the front is important also, but may be interrupted by the fact that all the left side, middle and lower tone, especially, are occupied by the heart. And so, it will be unfair to compare between right and the left from the front. Because we expect that there is dullness on the left side of the chest, like this, because the heart is underneath your fingers, while here is risen. However, if you are asked to percuss the front of the chest, remember that, always start by percussion of the apex of the lung in the supraclavicular space. And again, use the usual percussion technique. Put your finger, ask a patient to bring his head to the other side, and apply a little pressure above the clavicle and in front of the uh, trapezius muscle and uh, the muscles of the back and then percuss. That is resonant. And then compare with the other side, you do the same technique, resonant. And then percuss the clavicle directly by the middle finger and the other side and make sure that it is resonant. Dullness of the apex indicates an apical lesion. It's not a must that apical tumor. There may be ap apical fibrosis. There may be apical atelectasis collapse. There may be apical mass. There may be apical thickening of the pleura. But don't say pleural effusion. Because pleural effusion, unless it is massive, will not give dullness on the apex. Dullness will be down. Again, unless the pleural effusion is mass. And then you percuss space by space, starting from the first intercostal space down. So like this. This is the first intercostal space. Make sure that your hand should be in tight contact with the chest of the patient. Your middle finger is in the intercostal space. Percussion should be by the middle finger of the right on the middle finger of the left. Use the wrist joint, don't use the elbow, don't use the shoulder. So, and then compare, space by space. Reasoner, reason. Then second space, again, make sure that you are in the intercostal space, not on the rib. Reasoner, reasoner. Then the third space, and here the problem starts, because the third intercostal space in the right side, is resonant while in the left side is dull. Why it is dull? Because the heart is underneath your now resonant dull. Again, fourth intercostal is the same. Resonant dull. Fifth intercostal space is the same also. Resonant dull. But below that, resonance will be detected, especially on the left side. Resonance here is clear. Why is that? Because now we are moving to the skull tropes area. And tropes area we are going to talk about when we discuss the abdominal system. And tropes area is usually tympanic, hyperresonant, like this. Because underneath the tropes space is the fundus of the stomach, which is full of gas. So I'm repeating. Percuss the apex. Percuss the clavicle diatribe space by space, expecting that there is dullness in the third, fourth, fifth,
sits in the costal space in the left side in the big cavical line and then hyper resonance because of trop theory. This is not all the story. You have to percuss the mid axillary line. Mid axillary, not anterior axillary, from the front. So if you are asked to percuss the chest of from the front, that's what you have to do. And most of the students I notice that they forget to percuss the mid axillary line. Again space by space. Resonant. 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 Dull. Why dullness? Again, because of the upper border of the level. How to make sure? Ask a patient to take a deep breath while you pick up. Now, listen to that. This is dull. Take a deep breath. Hold it. Hold up. Now, the dullness has changed to resonance with deep breath. So it is the same mechanism. The upper border of the liver can be percussed in the mid cervical line. The upper border of the liver can be also detected in the mid axillary line. Finishing this, you finish percussion of the chest from the front. Last advice here that if the patient has pathology of one side, start percussion of the opposite side. And suppose, suppose that he, uh, he, there is a chest tube here or there is a mark of aspiration, pleural tap or whatever, or there is an operation of this subject. Then start percussion from the right side, right, then left. If the pathology is here on the right side, start percussion from the left, and then compare. So, summary, percussion of the apex, percussion of the clavicle, Discussion of the mid clavicle line, space by space, starting from the normal side. If you reach the balance of the liver, make sure that you check for the so-called tidal percussion, ask him to take a breathing, and then discuss the mid axial line, again, compare space by space. Then you do the same on the back, please. Discussion of the back. We discuss here only two lines, the so-called paraspinal line and then mid-scapular. Paraspinal, that is just beside spine on the other side of the spine of the vertebra. So space by space, again starting from the first, second, third, until you reach the angle of the scapula. Once you reach the angle of the scapula, here and there, then change the line of percussion. It will be no more the para vertebral. It will be mid scapula. So percuss the mid scapular line, which is the line just opposite the angle of the scapula bilaterally. Then I percuss the mid scapular line, compare both sides, balance here. Why balance is here? Again, it is the upper border of the liver. So you can detect the upper border of the liver from the front, from the mid axial line, and from the back. Ask the patient to take a deep breathing and hold it. Hold it. It is resonant now. Right? So this means that definitely the dullness here is due to the upper border of the left. Percussion of the back should be paravertebral until you reach the level of the angle of the scapula. Then it will be mid scapular line. Remember on the right side that there is the dullness of the upper border of the left. If you are asked from the beginning to percuss only the back <coughs> and not the front, so in that condition don't <coughs> forget to percuss the apex also, but not the clavicle. So if you are asked to percuss the back, percuss the apex. The same technique, both sides, but no need to percuss the clavicle because the clavicle is considered to be part of the front, but the apex itself 
can be because from the front, from the back, this, as I said also. And then you move in the same technique which you mentioned before, the part of the jibra and mid -scapa. If there is dullness in one side, then again when you start discussing differential diagnosis, start from the superficial then to deep. Think, what are the structures? We have the skin. So thick skin can be a cause. Subcutaneous tissue, fatty people, muscles, people who are muscular. This may lead to impair the percussion node. And then pleural thickening, pleural tumors, pleural pathology like calcification. When you go down, pleural cavity, then you make pleural effusion. These are called lung. What are the lung causes that give dullness? Fibrosis, collapse. Mass, tumors, or whatever. Some people they may have removed part of the lung, so called partial pneumonectomy. Total pneumonectomy, if the lung is totally removed because of some reason or another. Hyperresonance, on the other hand, is seen in patients with obstructive airway disease or during an acute attack of bronchial asthma or sometimes in cases of pneumothorax. So don't forget when you percuss to recall in your mind the differential diagnosis of dullness and differential diagnosis of hyperresonance uh, uh, in one side or in both sides. Then we start uh, again by auscultation, which is uh, the final part of chest examination. You auscultate in a systematic way. That is to say, if you are asked to auscultate the back, then start by the apex. Ask the patient to take a deep breath. Take a deep breath, please. In and out. Out. Again. Again. And compare with the other side. Again. Again. And then, you move to the back. Take a deep breath. Always listen at the breath sound. Normally, normally, when a patient breathes, we will be able to hear the so-called vesicular breathing. And I'm sure that you remember that the vesicular breathing, when the inspiration is longer than expiration, and there is no gap in between. I do the same in both sides. And some patients, you may be able to detect the so-called bronchial breathing. Bronchial breathing. Take a deep breath. Now, for example, the bronchial breathing in this area. What is a bronchial breathing? Inspiration is equal to expiration. There is a gap in between, and it is hollow in character, as if you are breathing in a tube or pipe or something. Take a deep breath. Some people may have pleural disease, like pleurisy, or the pleural effusion with pleurisy, or pleural tumor, or pleural pathology. In such a case, you may be able to auscultate the so-called pleural rub. Take a deep breath. Uh, Remind you that pleural rub is a superficial sound. You can be able to detect it superficially. It is leathery, so-called leathery. I describe it sometimes as scratching sound. And many of the cases of pleural rub, when you apply a little pressure by stethoscope, you notice that the pleural rub gets louder, higher. This helps to differentiate it from crepitations because in crepitation, if you apply pressure by stethoscope, they don't change. But the plural rub, when you apply a little pressure, it gets more. Take a deep breath. And then, after commenting on the type of breast sound, whether they are vesicular or bronchial, you have to describe the vesicular. Vesicular may be normal vesicular breathing. 
or maybe harsh, harsh vesicular bleeding, as in cases of obstructive airway disease. Most of the cases of harsh vesicular bleeding are associated by the so-called prolonged expiratory phase. What makes it harsh will prolong the expiratory phase because of bronchial spasm or bronchial numbing. So the expiratory phase is prolonged. If there is a bronchial breathing, you have to remember differential diagnosis. Cavity, consolidation, pulmonary edema, lung abscess, cavitating tumor, cysts connecting to the bronchial tree. And sometimes some cases of atelectasis as a so-called compression atelectasis. Compression atelectasis when there is a lesion compressing the parenchyma of the lung, leaving the airway patent. And finally, in the upper border of pleural effusion, you may be able, not always, you may be able to detect the bronchial breathing. Pleural rub again indicates pleural lesion, whatever. After commenting on the respiratory sounds, look for added sounds. Added sounds are either crepitations, take a deep breath, in and out. Crepitations are either coarse crepitations or fine crepitations. Take a deep breath. Most of the fine crepitations are oscillated in these areas, these are the bases of the chest. And most of the fine crepitations are bilateral. Bilateral, basal crepitation are almost always fine. Coarse crepitation may be detected in other places of the chest, either from the back or from the front. So added sounds include crepitations and ronchi. Take a deep breath again. Ronchi. Ronchi indicate bronchial narrowing or bronchial spasm like what is seen in patients with acute attacks of bronchial asthma or people with obstructive airway disease. And finally, by auscultation, you listen for the vocal resonance. Ask the patient again to say 99 if he cannot speak Arabic. If he can speak Arabic, you ask him to say Arba or Arbe. Say 99. 99. Again. 99. Compare again. 99. Again. 99. Almost compare. Again. 99. Again. 99. Again. 99. Again. 99. Again. 99. So, compare both sides. Upper zone, middle zone, lower zone. And remember here that what you say about tactile vocal parameters should be the same as the vocal resonance. You cannot say decrease tactile vocal parameters and then increase vocal resonance. This may become nonsense. It means that probably you don't understand what is the mechanism or you have some problems in the ears. So, tactile vocal parameters are increased in the same conditions which give increased vocal resonance, like consolidation, like abscess, like cavity, uh, uh, compression, atelectasis, etc. And Almost all causes of bronchial breathing are associated with increased tactile vocal parameters and increased vocal resonance. So when you are sure that there is a bronchial breathing in this area, remember automatically there is increased tactile vocal parameters and increased vocal resonance. Finally, when you comment on the respiratory, uh, sounds. I mean, when you comment on auscultation of the chest, remember to talk about it in this way. Type of breath sounds, added sounds, number three, vocal resonance. I give an example. Suppose that this is a patient with obstructive airway disease with an area of pneumonia on the left middle zone. Then I say like that. There are harsh vesicular breathing with prolonged expiratory phase on both sides. And on the left middle zone, no lobes, there is a localized area of a bronchial breathing. So now we finish with the type of sound. 
then add it bilateral wide spread ronkai some people they say sonorous ronkai and sibilant ronkai sibilant ronkai are those are fine high pitch sonorous ronkai are the coarse low pitch they are not very important but you may find some people very much interested in what type of ronkai so bilateral widespread ronkai all over the chest with an area of coarse crepitations coarse crepitation on the left middle zone that is the area where there is consolidation vocal resonance is increased high yani, on the left middle zone that is the same area of a bronchial breathing the same area where coarse crepitations can be detected this means what means that this patient has obstructive airway disease with an area of pneumonia giving rise to bronchial breathing coarse crepitations and increased vocal rhythm remember that there is an area of consolidation here percussion should be done so finally i'm saying that when you talk about auscultation make some arrangement in your mind type of breath sounds added sounds and you describe them in details and where right left we are much interested on the right or the left because some students they say cause crepitations then the examiner ask where they say on the left side the examiner ask where in the left side then he will say a middle zone so you can start from the very beginning and be generous give all your knowledge because if you give it uh, in pieces we also give marks in pieces same say that there are cause crepitations in the right middle zone just like that and then the vocal resonance is increased in the left middle zone same place where the now what is your final diagnosis my final diagnosis is a chronic obstructive airway disease, acute exacerbation, and lobar pneumonia of the left side to be confirmed by investigations. Same auscultation you do on the front of the chest in the same way. I remember to move again space. The most important here is to compare, always compare, and ask patient to take a deep breath. While you compare, you auscultate the front, and auscultate on the mid axillary line and please 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 at the end don't forget don't ever forget to auscultate the heart because many of the patients they may have an associated cardiac disease or some of them with core pulmonary if it is advanced you may get evidence of tricusp tricuspid in uh, competence or tricuspid regurgitation how do I know that there is tricuspid gears when there is pan-systolic murmur on the tricuspid area increased with inspiration? Take a deep breath and I can hear that the murmur becomes loud. Pan-systolic murmur. So at the end, they will ask you what are your parameters, what the indicator that this patient has caught or not. I will remember now from uh, the general examination say that there was hijack of the inspiration. The liver is enlarged and the tender congested. Bilateral pitting, lower limb edema. There was a pigastic pulsation transmitted from up down. There was left parasternal heave. There was palpable P2 when I palpated the left second across the space. And finally, by auscultation, there was pan systolic murmur on the tricuspid area, increased with deep inspiration, indicating tricuspid incompetence or tricuspid regurgitation which is due to dilatation of the right ventricle. Finishing this, you have finished the examination of the respiratory system and then the discussion will follow. Thank you very much.